Welcome to the podcast on negotiation. I'm Danielle Goodrick, Knowledge Product Manager at SIPS, and joining me today, I have Irini Etimu. Irini is a senior procurement professional and leader, having served a variety of industries and managed budgets exceeding a two billion global spend. She's a track record of delivering clear business benefits, profitability, and overall value with sustainability always in mind. From her current procurement role with Odeon Cinemas Group, she's responsible for the development and real estate, FM and utilities across Europe, covering 13 countries. And she's also a committee member of the SIPS Manchester branch. So Irene, I'm delighted to have you joining me today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the invitation, Danielle. It is a great topic and I'm uh, genuinely happy to discuss it with you today. Thank you so much. So today, Irene and I are going to be shining a spotlight on negotiation, which is a, sco- which is a core skill for procurement and supply chain professionals. Technical skills and procurement qualifications remain crucial elements for procurement professionals to perform negotiations well and demonstrate credibility through the use of models and tools. But the real key to delivering strategically is through the development and use of the right soft skills, such as communication and influencing skills, which work hand in hand with core negotiation techniques. SIPs have members globally across multiple levels with varying skills. So whether you're at tactical and operational levels, negotiation with just colleagues and suppliers, or at senior levels focused on influencing and negotiation upwards, pitching to the C-suite and raising the profile of procurement within the business. Different negotiations will require different skills and will need to be adapted. And today's podcast will hopefully give you some tips for success. So negotiation have changed over the years and this is set to continue to evolve as we enter the new norm post-coronavirus pandemic. So in this podcast, I'd like to be able to cover how negotiations with suppliers might be impacted in the future, plus how professionals will need to enhance their negotiation skills as we enter the new norm, with more remote working, virtual supplier meetings and less face-to-face contact. So it's great to be able to get your perspective today, Irini, as you've had a wide range of negotiation experience across various organisations throughout your career and faced various challenges along the way, I'm sure. So what would you say are the key skills for negotiation? So if I will consider the circumstances under which two parties need to negotiate, we will be able to better unfold the negotiation skills question. Life is negotiation. We negotiate because we want our suppliers to accept a discount of 20%. We negotiate about the price we want to pay for our car, the time we will send our children to bed, the color we will paint the walls, about everything, isn't it? Until recently, and maybe even now, negotiation skills predominantly formed around separating the person the emotion from um, the situation. I was uh, focused uh, more on my side uh, and uh, not uh, um, how we understand uh, what the other side um, um, asks. And moreover, we were predominantly focused on um, that um, the negotiation is um, covered around this win-win concept apply BACNA the best alternative to a negotiated agreement as soon as clouds arrive above the meeting table and keep everyone happy. However, I follow a different school and I see things in a slightly different perspective. The one that uh, as per Chris Voss, uh, negotiation is the heart of the collaboration. So somebody would be naive uh, to think that um, um, there is negotiation without conflict uh, um, and uh, actually, this, if we think about it, this is my interest against yours. However, the thing here is uh, for someone to find a way to resolve the conflict uh, with the least uh, damages and the, min- the maximum benefit. And uh, BATNA win win is not uh, the reply. With uh, BATNA win win, uh, you always aim low. And if you do that, it means that something's wrong either in your or the other party's side. So the reply is to achieve more with the lower damages by genuinely connecting with the other party. So skills-wise, I would definitely 
start from um, suppress uh, ego. So let's face it, we're not gods. We're no. people and so <laughs> the other party are. Therefore, we need to put aside um, our ego and um, arrogance and understand their side um, too. Their reality, how things could affect them, their teams, their positioning, the market, finances, no cash, uh, elements, etc. However, in order to suppress our ego, we need to have emotional intelligence. So Definitely. I believe that uh, it is uh, fundamental for someone entering a negotiation to be emotionally engaged uh, with um, the issue. The person involved uh, cannot be detached uh, emotionally, mm -hmm. needs to capture things that are not always written in the books uh, and the how-to. And uh, this person would need to associate words, moves, uh, body language, and evaluate them accordingly. In order to do this, you see there is a um, gradual uh, process. Uh, we need uh, an active listening. So think about uh, it. Uh, people want to be understood. Uh, pe pe people want to be understood. Uh, people want to be accepted. And um, effective listening can provide us with so many information about uh, our interlocutor that could be used to support the purpose of uh, the negotiation. Furthermore, as per relevant studies, when people feel that are listened, they tend to be less defensive and resisting. It is so important to laser focus on what the other has to say. This is where we need to recognize what the other party actually needs and why. Very often, um, active listening is perceived as a passive action. However, it is really important to understand here that we are talking about a very active process and maybe the most important one. The other skill is influence. So influence skills will need to be exercised as a balance. Balance the information gathered using the emotional intelligence and the active listening. This is the point where we need to understand the other's perspective and build rapport and trust. And obviously, in order to do all of this, somebody needs to have a thorough understanding, not only an, around the topic of the negotiation, it's not about the technical element here, but also to have this knowledge that would give them the possibility to create associations of uh, the product of the active listening with the negotiation purposes. So it is important for someone to be open-minded, not to enter negotiations assuming about people involved and assuming about the situation. And um, last but not least, um, ethics and re reliability. So in my perspective, uh, non-negotiation is successful if it is not based on trusted ethics. There are many cases of not fruitful negotiations, but with excellent aftertaste, exactly because of these elements. And you touched on there a lot of the soft skills obviously required um, and active listening and building that trust um, as well within the negotiation, which is key. So how would you go about preparing for a negotiation that you had coming up? Sorry, I didn't hear this. How would you go about preparing for a negotiation? So, thank you. So, when we define um, a need to purchase uh, a product uh, or a service, we start uh, the strategic sourcing. And uh, strategic um, could mean uh, various parameters, um, local, region, global, multinational, SME, exclusivity, split account, etc. These parameters immediately uh, start outlining the different negotiation goals depending on the decisions we will take for each tender and of course contract. Personally, my negotiations start from the pre-tender meetings. This is where I start collating information that will be useful during the contract negotiations. In general, there is always the thought about the best worst case scenario. In this way, I'm ready for everything. However, the goal is set for the best case scenario. 
I like being ambitious with my goals, but I know that I need also to be realistic and uh, pragmatic. The other thing, obviously, is that um, I'm doing my homework mm -hmm. about um, the other party. <laughs> so who they are, what they are doing, how they are doing things, uh, what uh, the values are, corporate culture, if I know information about um, them personally, that they will participate, uh, not personally, I mean, as uh, uh, the specific people that will participate in the negotiations, etc. So I'm trying to understand as much as possible uh, in order to uh, capture any um, issues uh, at early stage, uh, any deal breakers. Additionally, I'm doing also my homework internally because usually the supplier will have the day-to-day, -day, the daily um, correspondence and communication with my stakeholders. So I need to ensure that the needs are very, very clear and the expectations realistic. And uh, we have the message passed correctly, both sides. So at the same time, I'm collecting every information that could play a critical role in this day-to-day -day collaboration that could be a blocker in any deal. And um, this is uh, um, predominantly the way that uh, I prepare uh, my, myself. Uh, a lot of uh, preparation and ensuring that uh, everything is very, very clear and having my mind best worst case scenario and a very, very specific goal. Thank you. Like you say, preparation's key. So um, can you share an example of a difficult situation, perhaps where you came, came up against someone internally where you managed to overcome that to reach an agreement? Well, there is a case I could share here, <laughs> and uh, this is an excellent example about assumptions that we mentioned mm -hmm. before. So we needed to run a group uh, tender, you will allow me not to uh, share more uh, details, it's a little bit sensitive, about the critical product that we use in our um, sites in the cinemas. So in the tender we had national and global suppliers uh, participating. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that uh, the main stakeholders had the preference uh, to the global suppliers. And um, in any other case, uh, that could be great for many reasons. In our case though, the global supplier, the specific one, was um, arrogant, uh, thought uh, that there was no chance to miss uh, uh, the account, uh, significantly more expensive, and almost refused uh, even to provide a buffer. On the contrary, the local supplier, Humbler, came across with a very structured and realistic proposal 100% of our needs uh, open to discuss not only about the commercial part, but also about current future designs, business development, etc. So it was a screamer that the supplier we should work with was uh, the local, that uh, as we found out, was not heavily promoting uh, their significantly important clientele. They, they were focused on the technical element where they haven't marketed themselves very well. So I had to find a way to persuade the main stakeholder. Mm -hmm. And um, it was uh, a little bit tricky because uh, the specific uh, global supplier was uh, also supplier for our US partners, uh, the US parent company. So that was one of the reasons uh, of the arrogance. So when uh, I presented uh, the facts uh, and the overall um, analysis and the TCO together with qualitative elements, things um, changed uh, immediately. So um, the example, however, here is not about persuasion though, and I usually say that uh, I'm not doing anything different uh, rather than to share facts. Yeah. It is always uh, the, others, the other party's decision, how we we'll react uh, with the facts that I share. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it was a stakeholder's uh, decision to justify to the business why they should uh, support a more than 30% uh, cost difference uh, without negotiations, uh, without uh, changes in the product, uh, with an arrogant approach. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, 
of course, here yeah, we need to point out the local suppliers have too much humility <laughs> that almost made them uh, lose their account. But that was uh, tricky because uh, it is not easy to um, uh, insist when uh, everything seems to be against you, global supplier, uh, possibly leader in the, the global market, uh, being uh, um, the preferred supplier for your parent company that they pay the bills. <laughs> so yes, it was not that easy, but I think uh, um, everybody uh, respects facts. Exactly, yeah, and I think you overcame a difficult situation there, like you say, through sharing information and transparency and building trust and almost letting them make the decision with the facts in front of them. So, great example there, thank you. Thank you. Um, what advice would you give to someone then him, to perhaps resolve a deadlock situation in a negotiation? Uh, well, it depends on the deadlock, but generally speaking, I would say to slow down. Try to buy some uh, time to understand what is going wrong. If you have, um, if we have done our preparation properly, then something happened during the negotiation process. So, ask questions like, "It seems that uh, you feel like um, something," or "It seems that you are concerned about um, the other." So, try to unlock uh, the verbal and non-verbal signs. Uh, make them. Um, um, start talking and discussing about uh, um, what is happening. Okay, and then um, you've obviously ha been involved in a lot of negotiations throughout your career. Um, have you had to kind of be more positive and persuasive when presenting your ideas um, to a different to a difficult group or um, suppliers to um, move things forward? Of course, and uh, because we are talking about personalities, there are different styles, uh, assertive, analyst, uh, accommodator. But again, it depends on the situation and the goal, as uh, I mentioned before. Definitely, I'm changing my style and I'm preparing my approach, but uh, what uh, I don't change is my principles and values. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, really important uh, to me and I believe it should be for uh, both parties. Um, apart from that, of course, and based on uh, uh, the preparation, sometimes I may need to base my approach more on uh, the numbers and analytics, uh, sometimes on the vision, sometimes I need to be stricter or the opposite. Mm -hmm. It depends on the situation and the people involved. But uh, also it is, um, this liaises uh, with uh, the previous um, discussion about uh, being prepared. Uh, so we need to do our homework again and again and understand and read uh, uh, the situation before you before we enter to the negotiation uh, table. Okay, great, thank you. And obviously, when you're negotiating, you're looking for a win-win um, and making sure that things are in people's best interest. So, where have you managed to? Where is your your best example of where you've managed to negotiate um, a resolution that worked in everyone's best interest that might not have looked like it would in the first instance, perhaps? Um, personally, I'm not sure that I'm I'm looking for the win-win. Okay. As I said before, it is uh, the the win-win is uh, uh, aiming low, but um, if I would have something. Uh, um, in particular, in this point, uh, then this would be opposite to what I have already stated uh, before. Okay. So what I mean is that um, we agree that negotiation is the center of collaboration. So we also mentioned that uh, following the tactic empathy that uh, we actively listen, actively listening, um, we have this uh, uh, understanding, the insightful understanding. Um, we obviously aim to get the most uh, possible out of the negotiation. Mm -hmm. But in a way that we understand the other party's reality and their rationale to ask uh, what they ask. So if we follow this path, then negotiations would work uh, for everyone's best uh, interest. We get the most uh, out of it and we don't damage the other party in a way that uh, they leave the room humiliated mm -hmm. or make the deal an uncomfortable situation. The last thing we want is an unhappy supplier or colleague. They will never give us uh, their 100%. Uh, they will just do what their contractual agreement or framework suggests uh, and nothing else. Uh, we will never 
get there uh, over and above that only someone that would feel like a real partner would give us. We want um, to bend, we don't want to break, and mm -hmm. we want to collaborate, not to part with them. So for me, the reply, it, if I want to reply this in one sentence, it is either there is a deal or not. Okay. If uh, negotiations could be fruitful, then it should be for anyone, everyone's interest. Okay, great. And then um, just if we touch on the future now, looking ahead a little bit more, um, I mentioned earlier, obviously, remote working and virtual meetings. Um, now we'll have less face-to-face -face interaction almost forced upon us uh, following the pandemic. So how do you think this will change how we negotiate with suppliers in the future, kind of in more of a virtual forum? You know, Danielle, um, this is a great question. I was thinking about it uh, since our industry has massively been affected by the pandemic. Yeah. All the cinemas are closed, our offices as well and all our meetings and discussions should be conducted through Zoom or other VC software. I will tell you something, people's behaviors may change if they are personally affected by this um, uh, situation, if there is a, a drastic salary cut, uh, if there is a health and safety issue in the family, lonely people, etc. And um, of course this uh, could also affect somehow their professional behavior and performance as well. In general, I believe that uh, skills do not change by the means that they need to be communicated uh, or exercised. Of course, uh, there are always challenges, but if you have built uh, the foundations of uh, structured, mutually trustworthy business relationships, uh, you can perform it anyway, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, or uh, online. Mm -hmm. Of course, face-to-face -face is always better for many reasons, but um, I believe that uh, this um, situation has uh, softened us uh, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Not to mention also the impromptu intervals from uh, children, spouses, animals uh, yeah. appearing in the cameras, <laughs> making things more human mm -hmm. and an excellent icebreaker. <laughs> Definitely. I think, like you say, the humanization of people has definitely increased um, as people are let into people's homes, like you say, and there are um, features of children and things on screen as well. So, yeah, I guess that's broken down a few, few barriers. So um, just to finish off then, what would be your top five negotiation tips then for SIPs members? Okay, then suppress uh, your ego don't assume anything and be open-minded um, do your homework internally and externally be a nerd here <laughs> be prepared for the best and the worst but set your realistic goal for the best case scenario have a laser focus listening approach and exercise tactical empathy to understand uh, the other party's reality and ensure that uh, you gain trust uh, even if negotiations fail, it is important that your reputation um, as a trustworthy party will follow you. Thank you so much for that, Irene. I think that's really helpful for those listening today. Um, you've covered some great points there with preparing for negotiation and skills and definitely things for people to consider on all levels. So thank you as well for listening. We hope you enjoyed the podcast and use some of the tips to proactively take action in your negotiation planning. And we wish you every success. You can follow the SIPS Knowledge podcast channel to access the latest content at sips.org forward slash knowledge. I just want to say thank you again, Irini, for your time. Um, you've been brilliant today. So thank you for sharing your tips. Thank you very much for the invitation and for having me with you today. Thank you.